One question I get from students a lot is, how do I find the right piano piece for my current playing level? Well, your teacher Tim is here, and I'm going to help you figure out just that by giving you some really important tips. The first tip I have for you is to check to see if the piece is in a difficult time signature. So let's take a look at some examples so I can show you exactly what I mean. Okay, so taking a look at this piece right here, this is the Minuet in G um, from the Notebook of Anna Magdalena Bach. Of course, it's by Petzold. And uh, let's take a look at the time signature here. Well, the time signature is that number there right after the um, treble clef and the key signature. And that tells you, obviously, how many beats are in a measure. The lesson isn't about that. But 3-4 is a pretty simple time signature. Chances are, if um, you're learning to play piano in the first few weeks, first few months, you've definitely played something in 3-4, or at least you're familiar with it. So look for to make sure that you are actually familiar with the time signature. Um, you don't absolutely have to have played through it before, like in that time signature, but make sure that you understand what that time signature means. So 3-4 is pretty standard. You know, you go over to Moonlight Sonata, that's in cut time. You have to understand that cut time is 2-2, two, two, that there's really two beats in a measure, and then really you have these groups of triplets too, so you have to know how to play the actual rhythm. So the first obvious tip is look at the key signature, time signature rather, know what that means, know how to play in that time signature, and be familiar generally with the rhythms that are going on. Um, like I said, of course, the point of learning a new piece, I wanted to say this right now, is to go just past your comfort level um, and actually what you're able to currently do. And this will actually help you get better and better and better. You don't want to pick really easy pieces all the time. But on the other hand, which we'll get to in our further points, is you don't want to pick something so far out of your range that it's impossible because that will frustrate you. So all these tips ahead are going to kind of circle around and revolve around this key aspect. Okay, the next key tip is look for difficult rhythms. I had mentioned this a little bit in the previous uh, point, but let's take a look at some pieces so I can show you, you know, exactly what I mean. Okay, taking a look at the Moonlight Sonata again, you know, you can see right here that they have the triplets like I mentioned, so you should know how to do that. You know, you have dotted eighth, sixteenths. So the, really the point is, is that the question would be, should you learn this piece? And in what cases should you learn this piece? Well, if you're learning in the first few weeks, first few days especially, I would say no, do not tackle this piece. If the pieces you're learning look more like, uh, I don't know, that, or possibly this, where you're just having straight eighth notes, you know, like the canon in D, Maybe you shouldn't do something like the Moonlight Sonata quite yet. However, like I said, you don't have to know everything before you begin the piece, but you should look it up and should have like kind of an idea on how to tackle it. Obviously, listening to a recording would kind of help you get a feel for how it's supposed to sound. Uh, but looking through this, you can just tell visibly by looking at it that there's more going on rhythmically than the other pieces uh, that I've listed earlier. So if you're used to playing, you know, um, Jingle Bells or something like that, you know, something really, really simple like this, where you just have chords in one hand, a simple melody in the other, you might want to learn a few pieces before you get to this one. Check the key signature along, obviously, with the time signature. The key signature tells you what? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so checking out this minuet in G uh, again, if you take a look right after the treble clef and the bass clef, you have your key signature. That just tells you what notes are sharp or flat throughout the piece. And the main point I want to make here is you don't want to be playing um, in a key that is too difficult for you at the current time of, of you know where you are learning. So if you're only used to playing keys that only have one sharp, one flat, maybe two sharps, two flats, or even you, maybe you've never even played in a different key outside of the key of C at all. You know, you haven't really played with sharps or flats. You don't want to be playing a piece with six sharps or six flats, or uh, I would say even over three. Um, I would actually, when you're learning pieces, I would start from um, the key signatures with one sharp or one flat, 
then work your way up. You know, maybe the next piece you'll learn has two sharps or two flats, and then three sharps, three flats. You don't want to go from zero to seven sharps right away. Um, it will blow your mind, and you won't be able to play it, and you're going to get frustrated, which is what you don't want to do. That's really like what can go wrong if you don't know how to pick the correct piece is that you're going to get really frustrated. You're going to feel like you're not getting anywhere with the piece, and uh, that's a no-no. So you want to gradually work your um, way up. Again, you know, you can be looking at these pieces. Sorry about that. Be looking at these pieces from a physical point of view. You know, you can tell right away that, you know, there's quite a few notes on the page, but it's not insane, and there's not a whole lot of going on in the key signature. So... Um, that's what you want to shoot for in terms of um, your sharps or flats in the key signature you're playing in. A great follow-up to the key signatures is does the piece have a lot of accidentals? Accidentals can make a piece a lot harder to play, even if it's a, in a simple key signature like C major, which has zero sharps, zero flats, or the key we just looked at, which happened to be G major with a one sharp. What is an accidental? Well, let's take a look. Accidentals. So an accidental is any note that is not in the key signature that um, is sharp or flat throughout the piece, or naturaled. For instance, right here in the first measure, there's quite a few, quite a few rather, sorry, that should be a C minor chord, <laughs> quite a few accidentals, like right here with this B here, I should actually be showing you you know, the, the keyword here. So normally there's three flats in this piece, B, E, and A. So right here, that B right there, which is our first accidental, is an accidental. And if you have a lot of those, it can make the piece harder to play because when you really understand a key signature, uh, you're really in a, especially if you've been practicing your scales and everything, you have a pretty good layout in your mind of where the sharps or flats are gonna be on the piano keyboard. However, if there's lots of accidentals, that kind of throws a wrench into it. It makes it a little bit less predictable as to know where they, they are. So for instance, if you had um, the key of G, which we had that minuet in, you're expecting an F sharp pretty much anywhere um, you go with the piece. However, if it has lots of accidentals, you're really gonna have to be on the lookout for those. So be uh, vigilant and looking out for that. Okay, another thing you want to ask yourself when looking for the right piece is, are there symbols that you don't know? It's not a problem if there are symbols that you don't know, but if there's a ton of them and it looks very complicated, then maybe you don't want to pick that piece. You want to work your way up to there. Well, let's take a look and uh, take a look at some symbols you might come across. Okay, another example we have, I'm just going to use the same example again because there are a lot of symbols in here. So for instance, right away, the FP, uh, you're going to have to figure out what that means. You know, just looking through, um, anything basically besides the notes. You have Schwarzandos, you're going to have to understand what those mean. You have a nine tuplet. Um, I'm trying to f figure out what that would be called. You can let me know in the comments over here. You know, you have to figure out what that means. Do you know what that means? You know, you obviously have your fortes, pianos. Within the first few weeks, few months, you should really understand what those are about. You have crash, C-R-E-S-H. Do you know what that means? Sforzando piano. Do you know how to do that? Um, you know, staccatos. Obviously, you should probably know how to play staccatos. But honestly, if, the, if you're looking through this and you're like, I don't understand any of this. Well, this piece isn't for you. You should pick another piece. If you're looking through and you're like, okay, you know, I get the fortes. I know what crescendo means. Uh, I understand what sforzando means. But I don't really understand maybe like one or two of the things. That's fine. You know, actually, if you don't know a musical symbol, I want to give you a little tip. So if you go into your web browser on Google and you type in the list of musical symbols... And you, it's actually a Wikipedia article. It's actually really good for Wikipedia. I've never found anything wrong with it so far. But anyway, you see something in your music you don't know. Now, here's the if you know the name of it, perfect. You can just click there and it'll, it'll show you. But if you don't and you just have the physical or the symbol itself, you got to scroll through here and check it out and figure out what it means. So obviously, you can see that there's a lot of symbols here. You know, here's the... Um, rhythms and the 
um, note durations, you have breaks and things like this. So this is a really, really helpful thing. It's called the List of Musical Symbols, and you can find this um, over on Wikipedia, but you just type it in your web browser, and it will take you right there. There's the forte piano we had in the beginning of this piece. So right here, a section of music in which the music should initially be played forte loudly, then immediately softly. Now that makes softly? Yeah, okay, softly. That's how it is written. I just thought it sounded weird. Anyway, let's take a look at our pieces and um, see if we can figure out this forte piano. It actually makes a lot of sense in context of the Pathetic Sonata because it has a lot of these chords you're going to really hit and then right away you back off. And then each measure starts with one of those. You hit it loud and then soft. So as you can see right away, we were able to look up what one of these things meant and figure it out pretty easily. But like I said, if you don't know anything, then you want to pick a different piece. Okay, this one's a common sense one, and I've kind of put in some nuggets of this throughout the entire lesson, but it's you want to ask yourself, how much more difficult is this piece than the piece I'm currently working on? You know, print it out, that piece you're working on, print it out, take a look at it, a piece you're able to play, obviously, that you're able to play well. Well, you get it out, you look at it, you look at the new piece of sheet music, and you determine how much more difficult do you think this piece is than the one you're learning. If you're Like I said in the beginning, if you're learning Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, you don't want to be a learning um, you know, a Chopin waltz or something like that. <laughs> it's just going to be too much for you let's take a look at a few examples and just kind of hash out maybe how difficult they are compared to one another okay so here's happy birthday most of us have heard this piece before i'm sure and so forth well just taking a look at this piece you know if you're in your first few weeks learning this could be a difficult piece no doubt but, you know, just looking at it visually, is it harder than the Pathetic Sonata? Uh, no, not even close. You can just see that this is way, 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 way more difficult. So if you're currently learning, you know, Happy Birthday, jumping to the Pathetic Sonata is not a good idea. What about Happy Birthday compared to, say, um, the Canon in D? Well, they don't look too far off, right? I mean, um, this one, you know, has mostly quarter notes, very few eighth notes, but it does have some, especially with the dotted eighth sixteenths there. And this one just has straight eighth notes. So, you know, looking at these two, I can determine that if you're learning Happy Birthday, this version anyway, you can probably learn this version in a canon in D. They have a lot of the similar things going on. For instance, the key signature in canon in D has two sharps, which isn't too many. And Happy Birthday has two sharps as well. So it's a great crossover piece. You know, at least you have the same sharps going on in your mind because it is always a challenge to change key. Like I always struggle, especially if I'm learning a piece with one sharp and then I learn a piece right after that with one flat. That one sharp gets stuck in my mind and you know, I'm playing and I'm supposed to be hitting B flat, but I'm still hitting those F sharps. Doesn't happen as much anymore because I'm more aware of it. But it's very common. So if they share the sync key signature or maybe they're only one sharp away or something like that, um, it's probably a good fit. Let's keep looking and, you know, kind of pick apart this some more. So happy birthday. We got Canon and D, not too much more difficult at all. Of course, you want to scroll through later in the piece <clears throat> because pieces can be deceptive sometimes. They can look really easy in the beginning. And then you'll hit a point in the middle here, like right here where all of a sudden it gets quite a bit more difficult. Here we have runs of 16th notes and everything. But honestly, um, you really just only have that in the right hand. Left hand still just has half notes going on. So it doesn't mean that it's a deal breaker by any chance. It probably just means that you're going to have to spend more time on it. But if all of a sudden it looks, start looking more like the, the you know, Moonlight or Pathetique Sonata, uh, you might want to shy away from it. Or, or learn the beginning and see if you can't work your way up to that middle section. Furlease is a perfect example. In fact, let me get it up for us. So Furlease is a perfect example because a lot of students 
even if they're pretty young in my opinion, at least a lot of my young students can play this opening part without too much trouble, or they can play a, a modified version of it to make it easier. So that part's not too hard. However, Furley has this second section here where all of a sudden it gets quite a bit harder. So a lot of students I have that are 10 years old, they might be able to learn that first part okay, but they always struggle with this second part. And some of them I actually have to just, um, we have to either just learn that first part or you know go through the second part very, very slowly. But that's something I consider when I give a student for a lease is whether we're gonna do that second part or not. Um, you know, And so always be looking out for that when you're learning a piece. It also has a, this third section here, but that one's not, not too bad. If you enjoyed this lesson and you're looking for more ideas on what piano pieces you should be learning, check out this playlist in this lesson I have on choosing your first classical piano piece, whether it's Beethoven, Bach. I'll kind of break down some of those simpler ones for you and tell you which ones are good ones to start with.